My name's Robin Bowles, and I'm here in a personal capacity. It all sounds very good in theory. You mentioned Green Belt. I'd like to just give the example of where I come from, a Mole Valley mm -hmm. Leatherhead. Now, we've been waiting for years for the 10-year um, land allocation plan to come out. It was all ready to come out. And then change of government, now, now we have to consult again. But this time, at first the government said you have to build X amount of houses. So now we're going to consult and go back and say, do you want to build two houses or 200 houses? Y you know, or do you want to build houses over on that side or over on this side? And nobody wants to build, you know, NIMBY, not in my backyard. How are we going to get moving here and there's no transition plans and how do we make it practical? It sounds very good in theory, but y how is it going to work? Um, Kaylee Christensen, Community Engagement Officer in the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. Um, I think I'm interested in that shift you say in the last 40 years also corresponding with highly increased urbanization and how in a very densely urban environment you access that sense of community or create that sort of situation when there's often a high level of transience. I mean, in our borough we have certain areas that have 73% turnover every single year. And to go forth and say, get involved in your community, get part of this long-term strategy, join our civil society networks, volunteer in your local area, for someone that is honestly only there a year, is a huge, huge challenge for us. And I think yeah. we're finding the issue of being a central London borough, who is perhaps the only organization focused on geographical networks at this point, while everyone else sees their networks as very, very different. Um, how to interplay with that, that kind of issue, given that we also will increasingly be in cities as we move forward. Hi, um, Jackie Sear. I run an organisation called Empowering Action and Social Esteem. It works on estates in um, West London. Um, and there's an awful assumption about the, equal, e the equality of opportunity for people. Um, we're working with people who can't speak English and um, who come from very um, deprived neighbourhoods and I'm just wondering how much time have we got to achieve the um, local... I'm very much in support of it yeah. in, in um, theory, but how much time have we actually got to um, deliver on it? Because with funding and um, targets and all the other things that we have to meet, it's very difficult to gain trust within a year of a, um, building trust within a community and yeah. to take, take it forward. You've, you've got to be patient and, and work along the timelines of the community rather than government. OK, well, thanks for those three easy questions. <laughs> um, so, Robin, in terms of Mole Valley, I mean, I think the first thing about we've got to consult again is frustrating. Um, and one of the problems with local government engagement and consultation is what I call uh, non-sultation, uh, which is that a lot of consultation, people feel that the outcome is predetermined. So when you go back and consult them again, having spent 10 years getting in place a local plan, I can imagine that that feels quite frustrating and it feels like there's a blight. And I think that's been one of the issues for the past year in the housing market uh, and for local authorities in terms of planning is that there's been this feeling of blight. But that's perhaps inevitable when you have a government coming in with you know, not a message of continuity in an area, in perhaps you know, the way that has been in some policy areas, but with a message of very, very significant change. So the move towards what they call open source planning, neighbourhood and community planning. Now, our, we're not pure localists at the LGIU. We don't think that uh, central government has no role. Actually, we think that government needs to be at the most appropriate level. And clearly, there's no more important area to say, well, we need to look at the spatial levels than planning and get this right at different spatial levels. But I think it's absolutely true to say that planning became too top down that councils felt they were responding to national targets and always a national framework, rather than being empowered to make uh, the kind of local choices and have, and have a strong local dialogue where people felt that if they engaged in that dialogue, it could really influence the outcome. Um, and to be sort of optimistic about your question, I think there are some opportunities. The community infrastructure levy, I think, could incentivise development. The new homes bonus could incentivise councils to develop. But I'm not underestimating how tough it is to get people on board with new housing. You know, again, this is where the British public are hugely contradictory. Um, I saw a survey, I went to the launch of Shelter's um, terrific new um, Housing Insights 
um, data set they have, which, which shows you, it's on their website, it was only launched this week, and it shows you community attitudes to new house building. And the top line figures are across the country that 78% of us, I think 78% of us, nearly 80%, agree that we need to build more housing. But less than half of us are prepared to have any new housing in our area. So we accept there's a problem, but we reserve our right to say we don't want it on our doorstep. But I can be even more optimistic than just saying there are going to be these new national um, incentives like the community infrastructure levy and the, and the new homes bonus. I was out at a district council <coughs> recently and I'd been there about a year before. And a year before, the conversation was dominated. So the conversation I had with their cabinet about the future of their area. And the conversation was dominated by how they were going to stop the government imposing their housing targets on them. Do you know, when I went the other week, they were talking about how they wanted to build 10,000 new homes because they saw that that would be good for the future of their community and that they could work with the community to build support and incentivize that support around the benefits to their economy, the improvements to public services and so on. So I think it can be done. But as I say, I don't underestimate the difficulties that people experience. And of course, those difficulties are um, felt in particular areas of the country, and I guess Moore Valley might be one of those. Um, Keely, I, I can't really answer your question except to say that it goes back to my challenge about, I mean, I, I sense a lot of the people who ask questions, we're better equipped to answer them than I am, um, in the sense it's your area. But it does go back to my point about this being a fast-changing world and an intimately interconnected world. Communities um, that are highly transient share, have things in common. So if you can harness that, and I appreciate that that's very difficult, and I suppose you talk, you know, if you're talking about people coming in and out very quickly and, not, and being only there to sleep, and that's one of the issues about people feeling that they're part of a community and they derive some benefit from engaging. Um, I, think, I think that there are opportunities there around saying, well, what, what, what do these people have in common? Well, they have in common the transport connection, connections to the area, don't they? Uh, they, have in problem, they have in common that it might be difficult to get on the electoral roll or to connect with the local council. They have in common, probably, because they might be renting in the private sector or indeed um, short-term tenants of social housing. They have that in common. So how do you build community around things that people have in common? And I think the other great opportunity is to say, well, you know, actually, communities now are much more complex um, we feel, most of us, part of many, many different communities. And there are things that facilitate that sense of community. And one of those, of course, is information communication technology, and particularly the explosion of social media, which I think presents some really exciting opportunities to bring communities together. Um, and of course, that's going to only going to grow. It's only going to grow over time. So, hashtag your town, we're consulting about improvements to local bus services you might find that those people start to connect in a way that they haven't in the past. So that's my note of optimism, but I accept it's incredibly difficult. And communities are different. And mine is a broad view about localism over time. Uh, and I don't think that uh, it's the answer to your problems of the here and now necessarily. Um, I mean, I think the, the point about, um, from the lady there, I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, but the, the point about how long have we got to deliver? Um, I think this is why we need to transition to civil society being much more independent. Because what I see right now are lots of community and voluntary organisations, lots of people who volunteer, lots of people who deliver projects that receive some funding. Um, in fact, I met a lady only the other day, I was at an Age UK event, um, a lady who works with um, Chinese, elderly Chinese women for whom English is their second language. And she was talking to me about the withdrawal of local public funding for her project and the impact that would have on people and the isolation they would experience. And I couldn't say to her, look, there's much I can do about that, other than go and talk to your local councillor, engage with the council. Uh, because councils are right now saying, you know, we want to have a public debate. We want people to talk to us about local priorities and choices. So there is, a, there is a, an open door right now in most councils, I don't know which one yours is, to go and talk to them. But the longer term point I'm making is that we don't want organisations to be dependent on short term grants. So that when those grants are pulled away, that the rug is pulled from under you and the vital work that you do for people, um, you know, you can't do it anymore and people become marginalised. So it's only to offer understanding and empathy and to say, go and talk to the council, they might listen. And they might have one of these transition funds, I don't know. Because they're just doing their budgets right now, so some of them are putting those in place. I'm sure most of us were hugely inspired by the vision that you were presenting. For me, there are a couple of elephants in the room. Yes. Um, and one, inevitably, is how the, the positive aspects of current change aren't just going to be obscured by, by cuts. 
um, you know, the, the, the boroughs which will find guaranteeing savings through jobs and, and service cuts much more attractive in the short term than thinking about service redesign. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's, that feels as though it's going to strip some areas of resources for mm -hmm. the kind of regeneration of ideas that you're, you're talking about. The, the other is, um, partly picking up on what you just said, um, there's a lot of fear in the voluntary sector at the moment about losing opportunities to run services to the yeah. private sector. Yeah. You, you, you mentioned how um, some of what the voluntary sector has done is create whole new and important services like hospices, which, yeah. as you said, business would never have generated. But what we're seeing, of course, is those things that the voluntary sector are valued for um, can get undercut by lower priced services. Mm. Um, and a lot of the experiences of those either not delivering so well or, or market failure just just happens and then where are the safety nets for the people whose who's, um, services those are intended for? Yeah. Um, Do you want me to respond I, to that? I, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion at the first event we had here about the difference between maybe some of the financial animals and the human animals and it's the human animal talking here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, in terms of capacity, I think that is an important point. Um, some people, there's a word that some people use, I don't like it. Um, sounds a bit negative to me, but um, I get it, which is people talk about the hollowing out of local government, that if you take out too much capacity, mm. that local government may not be able to do the things that we want and need it to do in the future, um, including you know, having that renewed relationship with civil society and transforming services. And I have a concern about that. Um, you know, if you think about the uh, national publicity around um, the pay of senior executives in local government, um, now, I think that resonates with the public. That's why it's a good political message. Um, and uh, you know, that's why the good politicians are putting it forward out there. But what is the effect of that? Well, the effect is actually to pretty much close down the market of kind of movers in senior executive positions in local government. And who are the current crop of senior executives? Well, they're people whose careers have been built on being good at the old way of doing things, at performance and inspection. And undoubtedly, they're talented people. They're people who can meet the new challenges. But I think to kind of close down that talent in local government um, to, and the other thing about, of course, some of the redundancies is that um, the profile of those redundancies is that particular people with particular skills and experience tend to be leaving local government. And equally, there are less opportunities for people to come in and bring new skills and experience. So I think these are challenges for councils. But I talk to councils all the time who are acutely aware of that. Um, and who are working hard to make sure they have got the capacity and the talent in their organisations. I think, though, it comes back to the point about transition. You know, we were hoping that, even though we knew these headline figures from the time that the spending review was announced, towards about September, October last year, that the cuts in local government grants would be, you know, kind of across the four years, mm -hmm. and ideally towards the end of that four years, tapering up, so that councils had the opportunity to do the early intervention, the, pre the prevention, the community um, budgets and so on, and all those things that actually meant that they could cope more, sustain services and you know, transform services over time. But of course that was politically completely naive of me, because why would a government come in and leave the cuts to the fourth year of their government? You know, it's, it, it was a, a daft idea, and I kicked myself at the kind of idea that I was playing around with that. We, but there's no point in moaning about it. I mean, that's, that's what governments do. All governments are political. Um, it's how they get elected, isn't it? Um, but I think what we, what we have to do is look at, you know, where, where is the potential for things like um, social impact bonds and so on, for new forms of finance, and how can those things support um, better intervention and prevention? And just, just your point about the fear in the voluntary sector of losing those opportunities. Um, I think the, the, the thing for the voluntary sector, I mean, clearly the voluntary sector is, um, we sometimes talk about it in these debates as though it's one kind of thing, and it's not. It's an, it's an enormously um, varied thing, the community voluntary sector in Britain. So you talk about Bernardo's or um, Age UK, uh, or those big organisations that already have, you know, Age UK is already the second biggest provider of services to older people in the public sector, you know, as a commissioned service provider. So they're very different and a different place to engage to a small local project, the kind of thing that the lady there was talking about. Um, I think in those instances, there are a number of things I would advise. One is I would advise 
um, you know, make sure your councillor understands the benefit that your voluntary and community activity provides to their residents and what the effect would be of, of losing that. And I think the other thing is the council will be trying to develop a new strategy for strengthening civil society. You know, whether they're a council that embraces the language of big society or not, all councils are doing this because they know that actually that's, a, that, that that's the right thing to do at a time when the state is withdrawing of choice or necessity. So in that sense, talk up the contribution you make to civil society. Um, Emphasise the benefits of that in any commissioning process. Um, the other thing to do, of course, is potentially to use the community right to challenge. And uh, what uh, ministers say is that they will, be, they will be saying to councils, and sometimes it will be retrospective, but you know, where did you create the opportunities in the commissioning process for community voluntary organisations to come forward and bid? Um, again, that's something we'll be looking at when the guidance comes out from government. But I recognise the problem, of course. I'm Linda Chung. I'm a local councillor. And I sort of went from great enthusiasm for your canter through history on local government yeah. back to fear and anxiety. <laughs> and uh, I think what I'm going to say, many councillors will have already said to you, Lo I'm a strong supporter of localism. We do very much the things that you say may not exist at the moment, which is interact with the community, and we work very, very hard with them already. Yeah. Now, in, in, in your analysis, you've gone straight from, from that sort of localism idea, and we, which exists already, straight to sort of globalism. Yeah. I think one of the biggest things about localism, which I would be very pro for, is breakdown of bureaucracy. And also, it's a change of culture, because through your country in history, we've seen how things have evolved. But all of a sudden, you want us to go back to localism, a municipality. How are you going to get this culture change? And mainly, how are you going to change local government and local government officers and civil servants who have been behaving the way they've been behaving for quite a long time already. And also, the, the, I'm, I'm pleased you mentioned Age UK because in my local area, I'm fighting for two things at the moment, prospective closure of our libraries and also Age UK have had their funding cut prospectively in the next year. And one of our best resource centers is imminent for closure. Yeah. Now, you told that lady who I probably know to go to the council. I'm the council. I've been battling for Age UK's resource centre. I need help. I'd like your ideas, please. Okay. <laughs> My name's Barry Clark. I work in the utilities sector. I just have a kind of pessimistic feeling that, that in a way you're trying to put the genie back in the bottle because the, the business about the locus of power, municipal, national, global, is really to do with sort of economic forces. And the, uh, why we've become so national is that, you know, business, industry, everything has changed. I mean, I too was impressed with your, you know, summary of history, but there's a sort of 19th century feel about what you're talking about. The media have changed, people's yeah. expectations are utterly different. And uh, the power is situated where something can be done. I mean, I, I take the point, and you may come back to me and say, well, it didn't happen much with the takeover of Cadbury's, for instance. But, I mean, it, it didn't work to do anything about that. But nonetheless, you know, thinking that power will go back to the, the municipality in the way that it was is, is a bit of a pipe dream. I hope I'm not right, but <laughs> I'd be interested in your views. My name is Jo Howard and I'm a university researcher um, and I do research into local governance and the relationship between civil society and, um, and the local authorities in particular. And I'm interested, I'd like you to enlarge, but I was fascinated what you had to say and I'd like you to enlarge a little bit on what you said about the role of councillors mm -hmm. and in particular how you see the interface between citizens and local authorities changing and my in my research experience um, councillors with current people um, current um, councillors here accepted of course is that <laughs> councillors are often seen as an obstacle to community engagement 
or at least um, in terms, there is a divide between officers and councillors in terms of how they understand and how they, and how they um, interact with citizens. And so I'd like you to develop a, a bit your, uh, how you see that relationship changing and if the groundswell is going to come from community or if there's going to be a culture change in local authorities yeah. as to how that happens. LGIU publishes Councillor magazine and runs the Councillor Awards to celebrate the achievements of councillors. And we do a great deal to support the work of councillors. Now I sometimes say, you have to be careful that you don't give the same speech to the same people. So this was all original tonight. So I didn't use my normal line, which is that there are 20,000 councillors out there and they are the big society. But when I say that, it's a little glib. I'm not saying that they're all equally good at engaging with communities, that they all have the same skills. Now, it sounds like Linda is uh, a good local councillor insofar as representing local organisations and community interests. I think one of the things about the culture that we have, and you talked about culture change, is that councillors have been captured to some extent by the town hall, um, whether they like it or not. And, and I, I know lots of councillors get frustrated with the amount of meetings that there are and with the sense that that's about being a good councillor, that you've got to go to the scrutiny committee B um, every month uh, and so on and play and frankly sometimes play the games a little bit um, you know a colleague of mine is a councillor sat in his town hall until midnight last night uh, you know I mean that that's not really helping anyone a great deal is it in terms of good community engagement and really doing a job for local people so what I want to get away from is the idea that the councillor is and most councillors would agree with me and would reject any any suggestion otherwise but the idea that the councillor is the council the councillor is the community and this is my point, you know, my Thomas Paine quote, about government should come from society. So councillors go to the town hall only insofar as they need to to represent their community. I think there is a job to do around supporting councillors perhaps to develop new skills. And I think there's also an important point about you know, time and perspective, which is that if more people vote, if more people care about local councils, then actually, and, you know, and local politics becomes much more dynamic, then perhaps sometimes those people who've been councillors used to a particular way of working might find that they need to respond in a different way to their community. So I put it as gently as that. But that that local political challenge might actually be a dynamic that kind of creates a better relationship between councillors and community. But I think we should support councillors too. And the first thing to do is let's not always default to some of the, to the stereotypes that there are about councillors. You know, I mean, I get in a taxi from time to time People say, what do you do? And I say, oh, I work in a local government charity. Local government, councils, bloody hell, corrupt, you know. And you get, and you get the whole thing. Um, you know, you get the whole story. And it reflects somewhat on the national view and the expenses scandal and so on. But actually, most councillors I meet are hugely dedicated people receiving a tiny stipend relative to the work that they do and relative to the loss of earnings that they have, who genuinely want to represent and engage with their communities, but sometimes find that difficult, sometimes find that communities are um, awkward. You know, it's, it's something we experience all the time. I went to this Age UK event the other day to talk optimistically about localism, and I'll be quite frank, they all sat chundering at me, and I thought, well, I'm not sure why I bothered. And I think that, um, I mean, I try to overcome it, of course, but the, I think that there is a thing about councillors' experience of engaging with their communities that does need to change. I recognise that. Um, in terms of your request for very practical assistance at a local level, Linda, um, you know, I mean, I think the thing about libraries, again, we have this sort of Dixon of Doc Green idea of libraries. We are nostalgic for services from times past and the way that those services were provided at times. The thing about libraries is I see, I went to Haringey the other week, absolutely brilliant library there full of people doing all sorts of extraordinary things. Be clear, the library opposite the nursery where my daughter goes to school is empty, is closed most of the time. Now I reckon we could get some volunteers involved in that library and make it so much better. But I also reckon we ought to value the professional staff with tremendous skills who run that library in Haringey. And so we ought to see things in terms of the communities that they're in, the needs of communities and the opportunities that there are, both to support people with great skills, professional people who are doing a great job, but also to develop volunteerism. Um, now, I don't know the type of library that you have and, what, and what's the most appropriate model. But in a sense, I think the arguments must be very specific to that library and to the opportunities for it. You know, the thing is, uh, you find yourself being a kind of either trying to pin all the blame um, on some part of the system or being an apologist. 
Um, and I don't intend to do either. I've said politically I understand why the government have done what they've done. They had a mandate for it. That's what they said they were going to do at the election. That's their choice. In terms of local councils, I think some of them should say, well, perhaps we could have been doing more in the years of plenty to transform our services. But again, I wasn't necessarily saying that to them. You know, these, these, these were different times. There was more public money, and it felt like that would be there forever, which, of course, when you look back at it, you think, well, of course it wasn't going to be like that, because there's always these, the rise and fall of public expenditure, particularly for local government and local services. Um, but there's no point really regretting that they haven't done that already, but to say that they need to work as quickly as possible to identify good practice. And if you can, sometimes councillors, one of the things that councillors can do brilliantly, we do lots of... Um, I apologise if this is, uh, sounds like marketing, but we do lots of great seminars at the LGIU where people share good practice. And um, we see councillors going away empowered by that and they say, I'm going to tell my, but my lot told me that you couldn't do that. I'm going to tell them. You know, and they, and they, they're swapping cards with a councillor from somewhere else, ex email addresses, so that they can go back to their councillors and say, look, they can do this. Look at this terrific good practice. I want you to send some officers there and work out how we can do the same. So I think there's potential there. And just in terms of, because I know that um, there might be one or two more, Michael, but in terms of the economic forces point, the, um, I mean, the first thing is to be, uh, you know, the kind of optimist that I am and say to you, it's a sort of old Robert Kennedy quote, you know, some people see things as they are um, and say why, some people see things as they might be and say why not, and I see things as they might be and I say why not, and insofar as you're kind of using history against me, well, what was Liverpool and Birmingham? What were they doing? What was the industrialization all about? Well, it was about early globalization. It was about international cotton trade and those things, you know. So in the sense that the, the economy can be a driver, I think, of much stronger localities. If you look at the connections that are being made by many areas with the opportunities that the Olympics brings, the bilateral relationships there are now between all those, you know, 20 cities in China that are going to have um, over 20 million people in them, I think already have. Um, and councils in the UK. Look at the work that places like Leeds are doing, and actually globalism offers real opportunities for much stronger, more dynamic, more ambitious local government. So I don't think these things are, I think, I think that globalism presents challenges, and I tried to articulate those earlier, but I also think it presents real opportunities for localism. We have reached the end of our time. This oh, has sorry, been an extraordinarily, extraordinarily interesting um, Evening. I have to say one thing that's really striking is, um, you know, Andy coming up with this great sweep of history and, um, and a sense of where we're at, we're at a, a, a turning point in the way and the relationship between central local government and, and people. And the sense that comes out of the room is one of great anxiety mm. and great concern. Mm. And it's clearly a, a large mountain that we're all going to have to climb, and there are an enormous number of uncertainties. And I suppose um, I, this is one time when everybody in this room, and everybody in this room, is, are, are, that you are powerful people from where you come from, has an opportunity at this point to try and help guide uh, what government does to put it in the best possible place given the, the circumstances we find ourselves. But with, with that thought, I just wanted to, to, to thank Andy. I thought that was, that was absolutely excellent. And thank you for participating in the question and answer process. And, and give a plug for the next uh, powerful idea lecture. And this is uh, Tony, this is very, very relevant actually. It's Tony Travers saying, there's nothing to fear from a postcode lottery. Uh, very, very relevant given what we've been discussing. <laughs> Uh, and that's on the, on the 19th of May, same time, same place. Uh, so uh, please come to that if you can. And uh, we now have uh, drinks and canapes upstairs. So please uh, do your networking, come up with your ideas, and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you.